rescue the perishing. Lord, help us. Yeah. Because of that, now free. Thank you. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity, broken at the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful.
construction, look for storms of wind and rain. On a fill or curb or trestle, they will almost ditch your train. Put your teardrops alone in Jesus, never falter, never fail. Oh, keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Bless the Savior that will guide us till we reach your blissful shore. Till those angels there will join us in thy praise forevermore. As you roam across the trestle, spanning Jordan, swelling tide, you behold the Union Depot, into which your train will guide. There you'll meet the superintendent, God the Father, God the Son, with the mighty joyous plaudit, weary pilgrim, welcome home. Oh, blessed Savior, now will guide us till we reach your blissful shore, where those angels there will join us in thy praise forever. And I 
in the Bible. Let's get back in the Bible a little bit. Amen for this morning and uh, we shall not rush and we shall not get in a hurry. Uh, but we are we are dealing with the subject of let he that hath ears to hear let him hear. And we have gone through the the parable of the sower, and this is not the first time that we had gone through the parable of the sower, but this is probably the maybe the first time that we had uh, shown that this is not just a a, a one-time sowing by one man where the seed went to four different areas of soil, but that we have a successive Sowing, And that's why the sower is not named. As in the parable of the tares, the sower is named. I don't know if we'll get over that. Maybe we'll get over to that this morning. But we are talking this morning or continuing what we said about the good ground. The good ground. Let's ask the Lord to help us this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time that you've given to us. And Father, we would love to see... Uh, more folks, many more folks come in and be with us to hear the word of God. Uh, Lord, you know the efforts that have been put out by these that are here. And we ask, Lord, that you would touch people to come our way. Touch. We, we don't know, Lord, uh, that you would uh, just touch anyone at any place uh, to come this way. Uh, without receiving an invitation, but we know that's not beyond you to, to do that. Uh, but Lord, we have labored this week. We've been some, to some doors this week. Uh, we've talked to some folks this week about the Lord. We've left literature. And so we pray, Father, that you would just bring folks this way to hear the word of God. Father, we know that we have in our hands your words. We know, Father, we have also, uh, the biblical method to instruct in the word of God. And so we want to be a help to folks. We want to be uh, a blessing and we want to be a help to folks. And we want to be a help to these that are sitting right in front of us this morning. So we ask, Father, for your help today. We ask for your clarity of mind and spirit as we look at these passages uh, this morning that we have before us. Teach us, Father, again, as, as we prayed earlier today, teach us by your Spirit, and may the Lord Jesus Christ have all of the glory and the honor that is due his lovely name and his lovely person, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're dealing with the good ground, and let me see, last I, I believe last uh, week we said that it was good ground because it was prepared ground. And Paul's seed was not merely uh, the word of the kingdom uh, and the field in which Paul was to sow was not in the streets and the lanes of the city of Jerusalem, uh, but uh, to the uncircumcision among the highways and the hedges uh, of the Gentiles. That's where the apostle Paul went. And there are important differences between the ministry of the Twelve and the ministry of Paul. Uh, but for now, uh, it is important to know that the gospel of the grace of God was uh, also part of Paul's seed once he was given his commission, uh, that it was part of his seed and he was to preach to 
the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And he was to go out into the highways and hedges of the world. And Paul uh, had a special, special revelation, of course, given him by God. He, he did preach along with some of the earliest evangelists uh, in the book of Acts after he was saved. But then God took him aside and, and there was a further uh, revelation that was with deeper truths, and we know that that was the body of Christ, and uh, what God does with Jews and Gentiles when he saves them, and he puts them into the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we read, I mean, let's go over to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter number 13. And read some of this again. I'm going, I'm going to verse number 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. Now, and, I'll, and I, will, I will set forth this morning again very uh, positively and very uh, carefully also that it requires understanding even for the gospel of the grace of God. We say that often, but it does require understanding by people. And we, we do have a period of soul winning that's gone on for the last, uh, at least the last 50 years. At least the last 50 years. And a little longer than that, because I've been saved 40, uh, almost 47 years. And so it's, it's, um, it's been going on a lot longer than that that people have been asked to do something by which they are told that if they did that, they would be saved without them ever understanding the gospel of the grace of God, why they need the grace of God. Why do we need the grace of God? Why do we need the grace of God? What, what is, the, what is the, the reason that sinners need the grace of God? They... Why, why, do we, why do we tell sinners that they can do nothing to save themselves? They can do nothing to contribute to their own salvation. All right, so we have, a, we have a gospel to give, the gospel of the grace of God telling sinners that they have to see what they are. They have to understand what they are as sinners. Now, when man understands what he is as a sinner, I'm talking about... When I, we say that a man has to understand he's a sinner, he has to understand that he's entirely ruined by his sin, that it, it makes him entirely ineligible to try to do anything religiously or otherwise to contribute to his own, even his own salvation, uh, let alone anybody else's. So God has, God has performed, performed a salvation that is for the entire world. God performed something in the person of his son that suits every man. Look, it puts every sinner in a position to be saved without the merits of man. It, puts, it sets up the circumstances for any sinner to come to a holy God and be reconciled unto him. And God did that before, you, you're talking to a sinner, God did that before the sinner was ever born, let alone whether he ever thought about what sin was. God already had it arranged for every sinner, a situation, a, 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 an atmosphere before God of entire reconciliation with sinful man already set up so that any sinner can freely come to Christ but he has to understand what he is. I, I just don't believe sinners from the word of God, I see and believe that sinners don't just don't start flowing to God automatically without understanding what they are. Right, right. Amen. When they understand condemnation, the condemnation that is on them because of sin, yes. when they understand their ruined state, and then they hear that God has created a situation 
were for the whole world where sinners can, because of Christ, come to him. So the message is to go to all the world. So when we use, for example, when we were talking about the verses at the end of Matthew chapter 28, regarding going to the nations, we're not, we are not uh, knocked out of line or we don't get a crick in our spiritual necks uh, by those verses because we have something by which we go to the nations. We have something by which we go to the whole world. Nation or no nations. It would, what, if, what if it would have said, well, you got to go to the nations and you're going to somebody that doesn't belong to any nation because they belong and they live on a little island of a, in, the, you know, in an archipelago somewhere down in, in the South Pacific and they don't even know what nation their archipelago is a part of. God said the gospel of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation is not just to nations, but to every soul on the face of this earth. The whole world. Amen. So the whole world benefits by what God did in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ at a cross and a resurrection unto life. Death for sins. Death for the sins of the whole world and resurrection for the justification of any sinner who will receive the truth, believe the truth, receive the truth. I was just thinking that we sang a couple of songs that talked about believing. If a, if a sinner would just rescue the perishing and if, if they would just believe. Yes. All right, now somebody's going to have to understand what they are as a sinner in order to believe the gospel, yes. in order to believe what God did and why he did it. And so when we say those things, some people will accuse us of, of believing or stating that men have to become seminary graduates before they get to get saved. You don't have to No, a 10 year old, a nine year old, sometimes much younger. Amen. Can understand what they are as a sinner. God helping them from the word of God, showing them in his word. And this is where you need, this is where you need good, able uh, teachers for children or better yet parents amen that will deal with their own children and be be conscious of the things that their children say because now we live in a day when even Sunday school teachers will often take a, a child aside and say you want to go to heaven well the child thinks the, heaven, the child hears that heaven is a wonderful place uh, if you just pray this prayer, God, you know, you'll go to heaven. Even a child has to understand what they are without Christ, the condemnation that they are under. Even a child has to understand that. Can a child understand that? Yes. Yes. There, there, there is a time when a child can come to a realization of himself that he is, he is offensive to God. He has offended God by his sin. That's not a hard knowledge to ascertain, even by a child. But they do have to understand, and they then have to understand that the sacrifice of Calvary was sufficient to deal with it. That God shed the blood of his son in payment for those sins. Can a child understand that? Yes, a child can understand that. Can a child understand that the love of God is commended in the death of Christ? Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. Yes, he can understand that. And so the, 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 the child sings. The child can sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. So a child can understand, but it, it's still, it, they have to understand what they are. If, if they haven't reached an age where they have, are capable to understand what sin is, you just keep working with the child. Just keep working with them. Unfortunately, it's very easy, even at a young age before they understand or even have the capacity to understand the, anything about their sin. Unfortunately, some Sunday school teachers rip them through that same process and tell them when they're little, oh, now you're, now you're a Christian. Now you're saved before they have understood anything. Well, that, you know, to, to hear that you're saved is a nice sound, isn't it? It's a nice sound. 
And the, the child may not know what they're saved from because they haven't reached a time when they're capable of understanding how they've offended God. So it's, it's, not our, it's not our place just to go through a method. It's not our place just to go through a scheme with a soul. It's our place to deliver a message and keep delivering it with prayer and tenderness and kindness and desire for that soul to be saved. Whether it's a child or whether it's adult. I don't know why I'm going this far in this direction, but I, this, this, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've been communicating with some that have a, um, they've got a, an interest developed in them all of a sudden to work with Muslims. And they've started classes on how to deal with Muslims, you know, at their church or whatever. And so I've been listening to some of the things that they say. I've been reading a few things about what they write. And everything that I read says, well, you have to be patient. You can't get in a hurry. You have to give ample time for them to, guess what? Understand. You have, you have to be, you know, kind to them, be, you know, you show your interest in them and, and so forth and give them time. Well, I have, so I, I threw a question back at some of them and I have not gotten an answer. Why isn't it that way with every soul? Because some of these people that are teaching the class to Muslims to be patient and wait and let them understand will go down the street and they'll, they'll rip somebody right through a prayer in two minutes and then tell them they're saved. Do you understand the contradiction in that? There's a big contradiction in that because every sinner, every sinner must understand what they are without Christ and then what Christ has accomplished at a cross where God put him to death, God by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God allowed his son to go through a slaughter of himself to pay for the sin, shed his blood. God see the satisfaction of what Christ did. And call sinners to come unto himself. So see, it's not only, and I, and I agree that you have to give the Muslims time to understand. You have to give every sinner time to understand. Amen. It takes time to work with souls. I keep saying it just takes time to work with people. Amen. It takes time to work with souls. If it didn't, really folks, really folks, if you could, if you could, I don't know how, I have not heard the professions of faith of of you know thousands of people that are in churches in this county but i doubt i doubt whether there's even a defin in most of them i doubt that there's even a definitive time that they became a child of god i doubt that they would testify that there was a particular time that i came out of darkness into light here I knew I was lost, and here I knew I was saved. I doubt there's anything even that definitive in the people that you would talk to out here in the streets of our city. Let alone understanding what they were when they were in darkness, and then what you are in Christ once you trust the finished work of the cross. I doubt that it goes that far with most people. We've, we've heard enough. We've heard enough over the years, not only here, but elsewhere to know that people are, people do not look for a definitive thing. They're looking for a current present emotion. That's what they want. They're, they're, they're looking for, you know, a, a caress of uh, people and, and, a, and confidence that be doesn't belong to them. It's not some, they're looking for confidence that is not between them and God. With regard to salvation, they're looking for confidence that other people have in their performance in church. 
And they, they feel good because other people like the fact that they're there. They feel good because other people like the fact that they're um, they're helping in the dinners and they're helping clean the church and they're helping do this and that. And, and so whether they get that feeling in church or get it at the Kiwanis Club, it doesn't really matter to them. It's, it's, they, that's what they want. They want that kind of emotion. That's not salvation. We know that that's not salvation. So we're talking about good ground. So what does good ground here? He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word. First they have to do what? They have to hear. And what do they have to hear now? Right now. What, what do they have to hear? If you go out, if you go out today and you talk to people, what do people have to hear? They have to hear what, what is the word? You see, it's here, it was the word of what? In the parable of the sower, it was the word of the kingdom. But what do people have to hear today? Do they, do they have to know about the second advent to be saved? Is that the first thing you present to somebody? It might be part of your discussion. It might come up in discussion that Jesus is coming. Amen. You might even say, you might even say to people, you know, it's important that you be saved before it's too late because Jesus could come at any time. That's legitimate to say to an unsaved person. But what do they need to hear then to know that they're saved? What do they need to hear? What is the word? It is the gospel of the grace of God. It is the death of Christ for sins, in payment for sins. It is the resurrection of Christ for their justification. And of course, you don't just say that. You give them some scripture and you can explain through the scriptures what they need to know. They, that's what they need to hear. And they need to hear that God is satisfied with what Christ did. They need to know that. They need to understand that. They need to know that it's sufficient. Amen. They need to, that's, that's the word. That's, that today is what the, is, is the word that people need to hear. And then they need to understand it. They not only need to hear it, they need to understand it. And it will bear fruit then and bring forth some hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He started at the top, a hundredfold, 60-fold, 30-fold. We're going to say more about that in a little while. But it, it's, it's very important that people hear, and it's very important that people understand. And don't just assume people understand. Don't just make the assumption, oh, that person must already understand because they've been in church a long time. Actually, church can be one of the greatest barriers to people understanding. Religion can be one of the greatest barriers. The, the, lady I, the lady I told you about, I better not mention her name to get too close to it, because I, I intend to contact her. I don't know if she would ever hear this or not, but uh, the other night in, in Mitchell, I'll just leave it there, and she brought up Joel Osteen. And she said, well, I think it's better don't you, he said, she, she asked me, don't you think it's better that people are at least there hearing something than to be out and not hear anything? And I said, no, frankly, I don't think it's better. Frankly, I, I told her, frankly, be on, real honest with you. And by the way, she didn't really try to refute what I said. She was engaged with me in the, in the conversation. I said, frankly, I think there's more confusion yes. in false church messages than there is if they're just out somewhere else without church at all. I believe people ought to be in church, but they ought to be in the right church. They ought to be in a gospel preaching church. They ought to be in a Bible believing church. <clears throat> and, I, and I don't believe that it's better to be in Joel Osteen's church than to be home. To be honest with you. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It's, it's better for them to be where the Bible is preached, but if they're not where the Bible is preached, what can happen? 
The devil's going to use it just to just to create foment confusion in their mind, and a false message is going to be planted there, and it's going to that's what's going to it's going to crowd out what they hear later. If it's the truth, they'll hear the truth later. It'll be harder for them to receive truth if they've had a false, quote, Christian message implanted in their thinking. So I, I had to disagree with her on that. But she didn't uh, seem to be offended at that disagreement. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to write to her. I was telling my wife yesterday, I'm, I'm gonna, I need to write to her. Because they're coming out of, they're coming out of, False denominationalism. Now, any denominationalism is false, but I mean, they're coming out of denominationalism or they're coming out of a particular domination because of the wickedness in what they are going to receive through their general conference. But they're, they're, they're kind of still floundering. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? Well, I know what they need. They need to be here hearing the word of God. That's what they need. Right? They need to be here, here in the Word of God. What, what, what does this town need? They need to be where they hear, can hear the Word of God preached. So the good ground. Now let me go to the third occasion this morning, just in a few for a few minutes. Let's go to the third occasion where we have the expression, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter number four. Uh, if, if you're talking to me, you want to know what I believe, I'm going to tell you, people don't get saved by accident. Nobody gets saved by accident. Nobody lives for the Lord by accident. It's deliberate. It's on purpose. If you're going to live for the Lord. No one raises a family for Jesus Christ by accident. It's raising children for the Lord is done on purpose. It's done it deliberately. It just won't, it just won't catch like a spontaneous combustion fire. It's not going to do that. It's going to require headship in the house. It's going to require a family. It's going to require family concern over the things of God. It's going to require attention to the things of God. It's going to require the, the shutting out. Unfortunately, I say unfortunate. It's not unfortunate. It's, it's not the right word to use. It, it's going to require, for some people to think it's very unfortunate, but you're going to have to crowd out other things that compete with the things of God. You're going to just have to say no to other things. But, but I, I want to say this morning, I'll, I can stand here and say... In that gospel, in that gospel grace of God, you've got all you need in life. In that Savior, in that Savior, Jesus Christ, you've got all you need. You don't need anything else. You, you, don't, you don't need any, any other uh, thing that takes up your time, trains your children for you, uh, all of these other things that the world presents, right? You, you don't need the sports. You don't. I'm talking about organized sports. I'm not talking about exercise. Kids play extra. But you don't need all that other organized stuff. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm going to be a good parent. I'm going to go to where my children go, and they want to play baseball. So I'm going to be a good parent, and I'm going to be a Christian parent by going to the ball game. Personally, I find that a contradiction. I don't find that. I don't find that dovetailing with what the Bible says about being a good parent. That makes a lot of people angry. I don't think you have to join anything but the church. I'm talking about a good Bible-believing local church. Think of all there is, really, really, folks, think of all there is to do in a good Bible-believing church. It would take up your time. It would take up all the time you have if you're in a church that needs you. This church needs you. This church needs God's people. And there's plenty to do. It's not, it's, it's not as if we're just sitting here all week saying, well, we'll just wait for the next service. There's plenty to do. See? So there, there is nothing else you have to join. There's no other activity in life. Christ, according to Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 11. Do you know the verse? 
Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. Is Christ all and in all in your mind, in your thinking, in your desires for this life, for the things that you want to accomplish, for the, for the raising of our homes? Is Christ, Jesus Christ, all and in all? Or do we need to supplement? Do we need to supplement Jesus with something else? Really, think about who he is. Think about who he is. So the third occasion of he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. It's in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Are you there? Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. And he said unto him, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. So we know, what about the expression? We know that a change is coming because of the expression. Now this is the, this is the passage where children say, Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Now, I heard that in Sunday, and we sang that when I was a child. Three years old, four years old, five years old, six years old, all the way through in church, and then sang it along with the kids that came up later in church. And it, you know, that's that. If, if it is not with understanding, if it's not with doctrine behind it, then it is no more than Michael Row your boat ashore. You get what I'm saying? If if it's only uh, if it's only given as a uh, as a child song without any doctrine behind it, without any purpose behind it. Then it, it might as well be because that's what that's what you grew up in church, wasn't it? Michael, row your boat ashore and kumbaya, kumbaya. But but if you put a even if you put scripture with work with uh, music, and people don't know the doctrine, that's exact. You're you're doing no better than the CCM. You're doing no better than the contemporary Christian crowd today. You know. So we better have some doctrine behind it. Now I think children under, can understand that it has to, that that the the application of it has to do with witness, has to do with testimony. I think children can understand that. And they ought to be told that. They ought to be told to have a tight, clean, Godward, Christian, saved, Amen, testimony from the time they're young. You know. But when they when they think when they think of how the the light can be hidden. Is a candle put under a bushel or under a bed? I guess you'd have to say, hide it under a bed, you'll burn, you'll start the mattress on fire. I'm not going to hide it under the bed, right? <laughs> what happens when you, if you hide a lit candle under a bed? I don't know, man. Seems like you're going to start something on fire, don't you think? But it's not going to, it's going to be wildfire. It's not going to be godly fire. It's not going to be Holy Spirit fire. It's going to be the wrong kind of fire. You got to get the get that light out. So this is this is the third occasion it's used. It's not merely at the end of the parable of the of the sower, but it is at the end of the interpretation of the parable as well. It's introduced as a conclusion in connection with the candlestick, with having a testimony. And of course, if you study light in the Old Testament, if you study the candlestick in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, you'll get some things about this candle. You'll get some things about light and testimony. If you study those, if you study some of those things out, and we don't have time this morning to go into all of the tabernacle furniture and the things in the Holy of Holies, but I wish we had time this morning for that. The sowing on good ground was, and it is, fruitful 
in proportion to the measure in which the revelation of Christ was and is made known among the Gentiles in, listen at, in separation from the preaching in the synagogues and in the temple or in fellowship with Jerusalem. Now let me say that again. The, the good ground, and we're still talking about the gospel of the kingdom, but what happened, and we I think we mentioned this Wednesday night and perhaps earlier, what did God do when he called Paul and Paul began his ministry did he have to run, did he have to run and write letters to Jerusalem to ask, how do I do this? Where do I go now? What's my job? What do I do in this situation? Did Paul ever do that with the 12? No. In fact, his fruit came in separation from, not connected to Jerusalem and the authority of Jerusalem. And when the Lord says, he that hath an ear, let him hear, there, there's, a, there's a proportional fruit that is coming to the good ground as it is carried out in the plan of God, as God moves everything along from the Jew to the Gentile, from the Jew to the Gentile, and not in fellowship with the authority of Jerusalem. The candle had been lighted. The candle was, light, was lighted when the Lord came. And the, it, it, was no, it was no mystery that Christ would not only be a light to the Jews, but he would also be a light to the Gentiles. That was not a mystery. That's what the candle is about. That's what the candlestick is about. God is changing things. God is moving things. God is transitioning things. Because Israel, what's happened to Israel? What happened to their ears? He said, he that had the ears to hear, let him hear. Their ears were stopped up. Their ears, were, it said, became gross. I know what you think of. Now we think, when we think of that word with ears, we know what to think of that. <laughs> but they had stopped listening to God. So God was moving things along here through the, he's going to move things through the apostle Paul that cuts ties with Jerusalem so that the deaf and ear of the Jew does not muffle or hide or stop the light of Christ from going to who? To the Gentiles. So that is, that is the reason for the light and the candle. It's not, it, it's all right to generally think about it as witness because it is. But the witness is going from who to who? From those who have stopped up ears to those who have ears to hear. Let him hear. Probably brother, brother Ron. All right, look in, um, look in chapter 8. Luke, I'm sorry, look at Luke chapter 8. Look at Luke chapter 8. Hello, brother Ron. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse number 16. Luke chapter 8, verse number 16. No man, when he had, hath lighted a candle, covereth with a vessel, or put it under a bed, or set, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. Now we don't, we don't use candles much unless the power is out. Today. We don't use candles much today, and, and of course that's that's going too because of uh, battery operated this and everything else, right? At least for a little while. But you know, even if you use uh, battery operated flashlights and lanterns and everything else, you better have some candles in the drawer, nonetheless, because <laughs> you don't know. You have no idea how many hours it's going to stay off. And then you might have to go buy more candles at that. And, and that this corresponds, of course, with Mark chapter 4, verse 20, 21. The time was come when that which had been kept secret was to come abroad. 
and be made known. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And we see the candlestick set up in separation. We're talking about in Paul's ministry. We see the candlestick set up in separation from Jerusalem while the mystery was and preached among the Gentiles and believed on in the world. Believed on in the world. There's a great verse. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. Not 2 Timothy 3, 16. We're talk, you're talking there about the inspiration of the scripture. But 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. When he was manifest in the flesh, the candle was lit for Israel. The candle was lit for the Jewish people. There it is. Right? They, weren't, they were told not to hide it under a bushel. Not to, they were told to let it shine. And, and our children sing the song. He said, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Everything, everything that Christ did could be testified by God's spirit as being just. Everything. He did all things which please the Father. Amen. Amen. Seen of angels. You, you can read through the Gospels. In fact, you can read prior to his birth and then at the time of his birth and then after his birth, the time that angels came. The time that angels were used by God to testify of his person. Who ministered to him after the temptation in the wilderness? Angels did. Seen of angels. Now watch this. Remember, this is Paul writing this. Now it moves to what? Preached unto who? Yeah. Unto the Gentiles. So you have the light, the candle was lit. The candle of Mark 4, verses 21 through 23. Let him have, he that had the ears to hear, let him hear. The candle was lit for Israel. And then he moves it didn't, when, it, when he was born. When he was born. This is in the in the Pauline epistles. This is one of the few places that Paul actually references his birth. When where did your where did your life begin in Christ? Where did your life begin? At what? Hmm? I can't hear you. Yeah, at the new birth. Okay, that's individually. That's individual. But on what basis? The cross. The cross. See. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. Now he moves all the way over, preached unto the Gentiles. So the candle is lit not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. So... Can we teach that to children? <laughs> huh? How does the song, how does this, this little light of mine, right? How does it go? This, children sing it with me. Do you know that? Is our children on? Yes. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Is it, is it just as, is it just as legitimate for our children to sing that as it would have been for a Jewish child during the ministry of the earthly, of the earthly ministry of the Lord? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll let it shine. Hide, hide it under a bushel. No. No. Now the song, I'm going to let it shine. Huh? Oh, is that you do that? You're just giving that. Hide it under a bushel. How do you do the bed? The Lord said, don't hide it under a bed. You'll catch the mattress on fire. I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> don't get the, catch the mattress on fire. Let it shine. All right. Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. See how he's moving? So he moved, he moved from Israel 
at his manifestation as God, manif God manifest in the flesh, he moves to, he's justified of the, in, of the Spirit of God. In the Spirit of God, he's seen of angels. Angels testify of his wonder and of his, of his deity. And then the testimony goes to the Gentiles. And then it's believed on in the world because of what? Because of who? Is it believed on in the world because of Israel today? No. It's believed on in the world because God moved it from the center of Jerusalem to Antioch through the, through the ministry and the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul who said he was in, in Romans chapter 11 verse 13 he said I am an apostle to the Gentiles and then he gave the ministry of reconciliation 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and the ministry of reconciliation is to the whole world. And by the way, it's regardless of nation. It's regardless of race. It's, re it's regardless of, of wealth or poverty. It's regardless of, of political position or power. Or it's regardless of fame or what's the word for no fame? I don't know why. I can't remember what the word is. Infamous. Well, in infamy is really still fame. I can't remember what the word is. But it has no barrier. There's no, there's no barrier on earth. It goes to the whole world regardless. So you can't knock on you can't knock on the wrong door with the gospel. You can't go to the wrong place. You can't go to the wrong country. Now, a lot of times we really bear heavy on the fact, well, I'm called to this country. A missionary says, I'm called to this. God wants me to go to this country. Never argue with anybody about the will of God for their individual life. Yeah, right. They say, if they say, God's called me to go to Ghana, West Africa, as Brother Ruckman, or go to Australia, as Brother Heffington went to, or to Korea, as the Robertsons, they say, this is where we know God wants us to be. Just don't argue with it. But, but in, in terms of the power of the gospel, can you go to the wrong country? You can't go to the wrong country with the gospel. So if you're traveling around, you get it on an airplane, you've got, you got Bibles and tracts with you, you can't say, well, I'm going to get off. No, I better not. No. no I, I, maybe I better not get off in Senegal. They probably don't need the gospel. No. You don't have to worry about that. Just go give the gospel. There's only one place. There's only one place where everybody's saved. Nobody needs the gospel. That's Salem, Indiana. I'm being facetious. I'm being facetious. All right. But when you're talking to people, that's what. You, that's. I think that's what the impression you get sometimes. USA wide. See, huh? USA wide. Yes, yeah, USA wide. Yeah. It's USA wide. Well, here we go. The, the mystery was preached among the Gentiles and was believed on in the world. And now watch it. Look at the last expression in the verse, though. Received up into glory. You know what you have here, don't you? You, you have a, you have a, um, a summary of Christ from his birth to his ascension. And you also have a summary of the body of Christ, the body of Christ, from its faith, from its birth to the rapture. Receive, uh, preach unto the Gentiles, believe on the world. No, manifest in the flesh. We have a Savior who is God manifest in the flesh. Only God could do for man what he did because he was God. And he did that in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up into glory. You know what's going to happen one of these days? Pretty quick. The, the body of Christ, the church which is the body of Christ. You say, well, I think the, 
local, I think the local church and the body of Christ, same thing. Well, you, you might be very surprised that when the rapture takes place, there's going to be some whole local churches that are sitting there and don't go. You know that? Because it's because it's not the same thing, is it? It's not the same. To be in the body of Christ requires being regenerated by God's Spirit. Salvation, the new birth, it requires that, and it requires that by hearing and what? In the good, the good ground is they heard and they understood. Luke chapter number, you see how, and you see how the. The candlestick, the parable of the candlestick actually fits right at the end of the parable of the sower for a reason. It's jointed there for a reason. All right, Luke chapter 8. Let's look at the good ground here. We didn't look at this earlier. We'll read this. Just make a comment and we'll, we'll stop. Verse 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word. Now, Matthew chapter, Matthew 13 begins with hearing and understanding. Here it is, with an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. And then, as Matthew 13 and Mark 4, 21 to 23, it brings, brings forth fruit so good the good ground they on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart so there's there's nobody there's nobody that gets saved without being honest with God you can't you can't fool God you can't you, you you're, you're only fooling yourself I'm talking about any individual who is not honest with God about, about what they are. And that's, that's the point people really want to skip. That's what they want to jump over. They want to get over that hurdle without any self-examination, without any repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with repentance toward God. There has to be a, there has to be a honesty before God of what I am. I'll tell you. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you my testimony every time I get in the pulpit. But I'll tell you what, I know what it means to have to get guilt and have to get honest with God. And who, who facilitates, I don't know if facilitates a good word, but who actually brings that about in you? Who, who gives you the under, enough, enough light it's that spirit, that spirit, he, he is justified in the spirit. And it's that spirit that lets you see yourself. You put it all together, it's like taking that candle, putting it before a mirror, and you're sitting there looking in the mirror. The law of liberty is a looking glass, and you're looking at yourself, and you say, there's no deserving in me. There's no merit in me. There's nothing, there's nothing there that God, God, God cannot love me for what I am. That's because that's what the world teaches. Just love everybody for what they are. No, that's that's the world. That's that's worldly psychology. David loved. David loved Mephibosheth and treated Mephibosheth with kindness for whose sake? For Jonathan's sake. Now God saves us for Christ's sake. The heavenly Jonathan, the Lord Jesus Christ, in that picture of David, Mephibosheth, and Jonathan. God, God, doesn't, God doesn't love us because of any value in us. He loves us because of the value that is in Christ. And that value and that merit and that righteousness is given to us as a free gift 
when we see that we have no merit. We repent toward God with nothing. We have nothing to bring. Nothing. Nothing at all. Now that's where men don't want to get honest. Women don't want to get honest. Even young people don't want to get honest. And religion itself, religion itself today is, it facilitates jumping over, creating a hurdle over that step. See, that's why, that's why when the lady asked, well, don't you think it's, it's good to be in church, you know, rather than just be out of church? Well, some churches are, some churches don't teach you the truth. They teach you a lie. They teach you a lie about Christ, about what you are, right? So we we are saved for Christ's sake, amen. Saved for Christ's sake. All right, let's stand together. David, bring us a song, would you? We don't, we don't make assumptions here. We don't make any assumptions. We always leave the door open for some soul to come to Christ and always leave an avenue open for somebody to get something done before the Lord that needs to be done spiritually, personally with the Savior. It doesn't have to be salvation, be any issue. We always want to give that opportunity. So we extend an invitation that's why we continue to, ex to extend an invitation. We're not throwing it out. So this is your opportunity to do something with the Lord. If you, you have anything, you, you don't, don't even worry about what we see. You want to use the altar. The altars are open. You can do it in your seat. You can do it any, any way, but you, you need to go, go before the Lord with any issue. Any matter. All right. 293 in your songs and hymns of the heart, big thick red book. 293, Jesus paid it all. On that first, I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in need is small, child of weakness, watch and
crimson stain. Sin had ruined me. My sin offended God in all of His holiness. In all of His sinlessness and the sinlessness of my Savior. I am, I am offensive to God. That's a lost man needs to know that, understand that. We want to get around that somehow. But we need to take the time with people, show them the scriptures to understand. And what a marvelous Savior. Because regardless of the offensiveness of the sinner, where sin abounded, grace did much more about it. Amen. Otherwise, there'd be no hope. There'd be no hope for me. There'd be no hope for me. All right. Well, any word before we dismiss? We'll dismiss and go eat. Fellowship together. Come back at two. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your wonder, your grace, your help today. Thank you, Father, for the good grace of God. Thank you, Father, that how that you lit the candle, you moved the light. Uh, you said, Father, that, you, that the Son of God would be a light to, the, to Israel and also a light to the Gentiles. Lord, had Israel, oh, had Israel not, put, not tried to put the light under a bushel. How blessed they would have been in that day. How fruitful they would have been for Christ, their Messiah, in that day. Father, thank you, though, that you didn't stop it there and leave the Gentile world in darkness. Thank you, Father, for moving that light yes. to the whole world, to the whole world. Thank you, Lord. And uh, we want to be faithful, Father, to continue to set that light out for all to see it, Father. All. And we pray, Father, for the salvation of sinners, our neighbors, our town, our area here, Father. Thank you for setting the light out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. You may.